Hello everybody, it's been a really busy Monday for me, so somehow I got to do pretty much everything else besides my video for the day. So here it comes, a little bit late, but it's better to have it late than never. And so for today I've prepared a game between Lanier Dominguez and Vasily Ivanchuk played in the Capablanca Memorial round 5. So let's get started. Dominguez started with e4, Ivanchuk e5. We have the Rui Lopez, a very typical answer for Ivanchuk. b5, bishop b3, knight a5. So far so good. This is kind of typical. We've seen something like this before. Uh, I'm not going to emphasize so much on this knight a5 line, but um, certainly it's something a little bit more rare than usually. Um, as I mentioned before, knight f6 is the typical move. Um, in this position or earlier instead of playing b5 we normally play knight f6 castle bishop e7 but in this game Ivanchuk played his style b5 first and here knight a5 okay so after castle d6 d4 white is uh, getting the control over the center pretty fast in the game and now Ivanchuk captures in b3, a takes b3, and here a move that maybe you wouldn't expect to see, and if you would be my student, I would tell you, please do not make that move in e4, e5. Um, and that move is f6. Well, when it is necessary to make a certain move, you have to make it, right? So, um, what to say about this position? Um... It's, it's certainly a little bit strange to play f6 in e4, e5 because of this, the weakening of this diagonal, specifically with your king in the center, you certainly don't want to allow some queen h5 coming and uh, making you um, not castle anymore and remain with the king in the center. But in this position, it is necessary for black to play f6 because um, a threat in e5 is on the way, right, is right now, white does want to capture an e5, and if you don't do anything about it, um, I'll capture, what else can you do in order to protect your pawn? Well, the best thing you can do besides f6 is to capture in d4, but in that case, you're simply giving up the center, which, of course, um, you might not want to do. Queen takes d4 here, and, um, for example, if black goes knight f6, knight c3, white has a very easy development, and black doesn't have um, any pawn in the center, is going to be tough to get back in the game. c5 would be a typical move to play, but the problem is after playing c5, black does uh, remain with the d6 pawn backwards and then gives away the d5 square. So certainly not something that black would like to play, and that's why he's actually forced to play f6. And you might be surprised or not, but this was played and continued um, after knight c3, bishop b7, knight h4, white of course now has a very simple threat of queen h5, so knight e7, and now castle, uh, c capture in e5, I apologize, d takes e5, you see this is what happens when you're not making your recording on time. You get tired and you start saying random moves that <laughs> are way far from the game. Um, so queen f3, queen d7, finishing up the development, rook d1, queen e6, what to do? I mean, you really need to find the right spot for your queen, and certainly you wouldn't want to put it in c8 or b8, so certainly e6 is a nice square, trying to control the light squares that you weakened when playing f6. And after bishop e3, I want to mention that there actually was a game played here, until here, in 1955. This is a really old line and I didn't want to mention from the beginning, but here it comes. And in this position, which was played between Spassky and Taimanov in Moscow, in once again 1955, Taimanov played g5, which is a big blunder. Now I will switch, well, flip the board and see if you can find why g5 is a big blunder. Be sure to pause the video and spend some time to find the answer. Okay, 
by now you should have been able to pause the video and uh, find the answer. Uh, the solution in this position is knight takes b5. Now let's let's see what just happened after g5. After g5, black weakened this diagonal. But if you were to just play queen h5 check, queen f7, uh, the best that you can get is go queen g4 back. You of course don't want to trade pieces when black's king is in the center. So you can go queen g4 back and threaten mate. But of course, black can respond bishop c6 and you do have a slightly better position. But how are you going to do next? You know, I mean, you need to move your knight. It's attacked in h4, right? You have to play some knight f5. And then maybe I can play h5 with black. Chase your queen away. And now trade your knight. And bishop d6. And although the position is still slightly better for white, it is unclear how white is actually going to improve this position. I do have with black the bishop pair. So that's why this knight b5 is amazing, because we are forcing black to take back, unless, you know, you want to have a pawn down, and uh, allow me to capture another pawn there. So pawn takes. Now, important move, check, okay? Black has only one move, queen f7. Obviously, knight g6 just loses immediately after knight takes, because that pawn in h7 is pinned. So queen f7, rook takes a check, bishop takes, and now what do we do? A very simple tactics, rook d8 check, king takes, queen takes f7, and after another 20 moves, Spassky uh, won this game. Certainly there's a little bit of uh, compensation for black because they do have um, a rook and two pieces for the queen, but you know, that compensation is more like just to say that there is a compensation because a, a lot of black pawns are just falling apart. Now queen takes f6, rook g8, and now um, Spassky played f3 here just to make sure his position is well um, protected. There won't be any potential counterattack for black and um, now more pawns are going to fall. And um, I certainly recommend you seeing that game once again. Spassky against Taimanov in Moscow 1955. Well, it's something very interesting to know about this line. And um, I like to see, you know, that Ivanchuk kind of brought it back to life here. And of course, with a better move here, not G6, uh, not G5, but G6. Um, of course, you know, not allowing Queen H5. Um, first knight b5 and then queen h5 and uh, losing the game. So now with g6, another pawn move. Um, you know, I chose this game to kind of emphasize on the importance of knowing your history, first of all. Um, knowing uh, the, you know, famous chess games which have been played in your, um, the lines that you're playing. Which is something that probably I should study a little bit more myself. So, um... Number one thing. Number two thing um, is I want to show that e45 is uh, quite a stable opening despite the uh, parts where sometimes you might have to make weaknesses. And like we, we have seen here, sometimes you can play moves like f6 and g6 and a lot of pawn moves as long as you keep your position, um, co your pieces connected and make sure that you are... Uh, Keeping your uh, your king safe. That's something very, very important. So let's see how Ivanchuk was able to convert this into a win. Because the position is still much better for white. Well, not much, but slightly better for white. Here, um, Dominguez played bishop c5. I like this move, trying to, to stay a little bit more active. And now, king f7. Now, as you... Well, have noticed, rook c8 is another move that actually was played here in this position. So g6 by Ivanchuk was uh, not really a novelty. Maybe uh, maybe he was aware of this rook c8 uh, from a game between Paschal and Nikcevic. I hope I'm pronouncing their names correctly, which was played in 2001 in Belgrade. And black played rook c8 here and after h3 
knight c6. But uh, it does seem like white has a lot of a well counterplay in knight d5 with tempo. And after bishop takes c5, check. Uh, rook d7, check. And black was forced to give away the queen. There's no way to escape with the king to f8, obviously, because simply knight takes h7 and white is winning. So I am sure Ivan Chuk uh, chose here. You cannot really take immediately because there's queen f7 check. And after knight e7, another check. This, this position is certainly in... Uh, White's advantage. So I'm sure Ivanchuk tried to find a better way to hold on to the position until he's able to finish the development, after which the position should get close to equal. So he went for king f7. Now, if you cannot castle the normal way to just, you know, one move castle, sometimes you can do it um, by moving the king to a safer location and then getting the rook out. So this is this is a nice way um, that you can try to remember to bring your king to safety by just basically moving it and um, circling it by a lot of pieces. Queen e3. And now uh, Ivanchuk went bishop g7. And here I was very surprised to see Lanier Dominguez's move. I feel that in this position, um, it's certainly not uh, much better for white, but he is slightly better. He does have um, the rook on the d file for the moment. Um, his bishop in c5 is better placed. Um, uh, black's pawn structure doesn't seem to be really um, that great. They can't really play c6 to have it better connected because they would close this bishop. So, you know, and white, uh, although they don't have the bishop pair, in fact, black does have the bishop pair, they can't do very much with it because the center is closed. So in this position, I would just go rook d2 and after rook d8, rook d1. Now I'm basically forcing you to either move the rook away or make the trade in d2. If you make the trade into Two queen takes, threatening the activation on d7. So bishop c6 to stop that. And now white has this move, f4. And really trying to utilize black's badly placed king. And now, for example, if you try to bring it to safety, white can go f5. And uh, this position becomes dangerous for black. Because after capture, white can now capture intermediate, but now black has to take back and knight takes f5. It's very, very different from the move that was actually played in the game. And I was very surprised by bishop takes e7 immediately. Now you don't have any f4, f5. You cannot utilize the square for your knight. You're simply giving your other bishop for this knight, which really didn't do much in e7. It was just a protecting piece, but... It's not like white can actually bring something to the game. And after queen takes e7, there are no entrances for, for white. Knight d5 is the only possibility which actually was played. But white, can, um, white doesn't do... Well, just attacks the queen. And of course, black can just capture immediately. And after rook takes, rook d8. And suddenly, you know, uh, we can't really see white's advantage anymore. It's, there's a knight versus a bishop, and it would be great if you could try to find a great place for this knight. But it's very hard to find, you know, maybe c5 would be a nice place, but, you know, I can just chase you away with bishop f8. This bishop is badly placed currently, but it can always get back into the game with bishop f8, bishop c5, and, um, you know, uh, black has no problems. It is your knight that doesn't really have a great square. So it was a very uh, bad positional mistake, I think, capturing the knight in e7. So here, after rook h to d8, um, white can't really afford to keep a rook in d5. For example, if white would play uh, rook a to 
D1, but I can simply capture. And now he's bringing the second rook to trade. Because the more pieces black trades, the better it is. This bishop will finally be able to be brought into play if the queen and the, um, the rooks are being traded. So, you know, after queen d2, once again, um, well, we don't need to trade now. We can play rook d6 and then try to double and then force the trade later on in d6. But here... Um, Dominguez captured in d8, rook takes, and now he improved the position of his knight. And so did Ivanchuk, bishop f8. Now, after h3, there is a um, law, basically, of chess that states that when you remain with a bishop on the board, and you still have your queen on the board as well, you should try to keep your queen on the opposite color than the bishop, so that the queen can uh, work together with the bishop in controlling more squares on the board, so that is the reason why Ivanchuk played queen e6. Not only that, of course, now this bishop gets opened as well, and um, he can try to find a nice place for it. After knight e1, trying desperately to improve the position of the knight, I like this rook d4, and Dominguez blundered here, um, it was with this move, f3. Why is this a blunder? We're going to see in a second. But instead, I'm just thinking, well, this rook is very active in d4, and certainly black has a clear idea, playing bishop c5, and then moving the, mo the rook somewhere with tempo, and that bishop has reached a certainly much, much better place than g7. So white should really not allow this bishop c5 to be played. I think c3 is the right way to go. Once that rook is chased, either, you know, I think d6 so that the queen could come to d7 and try to get the access on the d-file. Now white can play b4, placing a pawn on the dark square to restrict black's bishop. Uh, and this position, I think, is about equal. White doesn't have a good spot for the knight, but black is struggling with their bishop in f8 as well. But f3... Why is this a big blunder? Well, you're simply weakening the a7 g1 diagonal right on time for black to play bishop c5. And after bishop c5, there's no way to stop rook d1. And here after king h2, black can go rook d1, queen takes c5. I've got for the moment an exchange. You can take a pawn in c7, but I'm not really worried about it. Your knight is struggling. The queen can go back to c3. We chase it away. You can give a check in g7. Now that the king is brought back to safety, you also have to kind of protect your knight, whether queen e2 or knight d3. And here, simply a5. And uh, black should find sufficient ways of uh, transforming this game into a win. Um, h5, h4 are some ideas, and then the queen could try to come that way to checkmate. And, uh, yeah. Surprisingly, also, Ivanchuk said, I'll forgive you, I'm not going to play bishop c5 immediately, uh, let me try to utilize the d-file. So he went more for uh, a more um, positional approach, which is surprising, knowing that he's um, a brilliant tactical chess player. Um, so he played queen d6. He maybe missed it or decided to give his opponent another chance. So he played queen d6. And from here on, I really want to emphasize on how nicely black improved his position. And this is meant to help you realize that although you might think, uh, just in theory, that the knight in close position is uh, in close positions, I should say, is better than the bishop. It doesn't always happen that way. So you really need to consider position by position. Theories are there for a reason to guide you, but then chess is the type of game that you have to make decisions at the board, and every single position is um, has its own properties, its own creativity. So unless you are um, deciding to... Um, Unless you're making a correct evaluation, um, you could 
reach a position like this where you think you're better, but you you know the the moves prove that you're not. So here, uh, Ivanchuk has to try to improve his position because um, the bishop certainly cannot come to c5 easily. So how to improve the position? Trying to push the pawn slowly. C5. Now uh, Dominguez brought his king in the center. A nice uh, a nice approach. Bishop g7. This move, uh, I wasn't 100% sure I understood. It was more like a waiting move. Um, when you don't know what to do, you know, you, you make moves like this, it gets 30 seconds, uh, 30 seconds you might um, make uh, your opponent think more and lose time and then make the wrong decision. And here, uh, Dominguez just made a queen move, which gave black a slight activity now here with bishop h6. Rook d1, c4. Pawn takes. Of course, we take back with the pawn. We cannot afford to allow this um, p um, reverse pin to open up. Uh, B takes e4. Knight f2. Now, white is happy to make some uh, peace trades because they only have one pawn on, on the dark square. So, um, it's going to be very hard for black to try to win this position. But of course, Ivanchuk didn't trade pieces. He is trying to improve the position of his king first. He does own the d-file, and whenever necessarily, um, he will make the trade. But for the moment, it's important to improve the position of his king because white doesn't have any activity with the queen to try to create some perpetual check or anything in those terms. Dominguez captured in d4. I think this was the right decision. Queen takes, and now. There's a little threat there. C3 would be the move um, that, looking at the position, white might not want to play because they're putting another pawn on dark square. So blockading it on dark square, which would mean that in case of queen trades, it's going to be easy for this bishop to try to attack and grab those pawns. Uh, however, it was totally possible here uh, because... Um, if you really want to try to have something with black, you have to trade queens. And once this happens, we can... Uh, well, actually, we cannot trade just yet. We might just be able to capture in c4. This might be a wise, uh, wiser solution. And after check, king e2, check, back. Another check, we come back. And uh, the best that can happen here for black is a perpetual check. There's no way to try to win more material. This pawn is hanging too, and also white does have a perpetual here. Anyways, but white play knight d1. Still, the position is equal. Bishop c1. And here, he bla he made a mistake once again. He played b3. Once again, this game shows a lot of the theories have to be uh, double-checked before you're actually playing them. Although it seems very natural to put your pawns on the opposite color of the bishop now that you have a knight versus a bishop. You, of course, don't want the bishop to be able to capture your pawns. Surprisingly, b3 is a mistake. And it is c3 that would have been the right move. And once again, here we've got the, a similar line to what we saw earlier. Just now, white cannot capture in c4 because the knight is hanging. So they have to trade queens, but do not worry. After king e2... Bishop c1, white can play knight e3. If you capture in e3, the end game should be a draw. So, um, because there won't be entrances on this side, and on that side, white will be able to protect that pawn and, and um, make a draw. And if black captures in b2, a very important move for white to save the game, king d2 first. Protecting the pawn, because this pawn in c4 is not going anywhere. So now that the bishop has to leave, knight takes e4. And after bishop c5, all these pawns are on white square, so impossible for black to grab. And after king c2, this position is going to end in a draw because um, there will be no way for black to progress this position. No weaknesses to attack. 
But B3, why is B3 a mistake? Well, because it will allow black to um, create a pass pawn. A5. White will never be able to capture in C4 because this pawn is going to go for a queen. And uh, now white is put in a very difficult situation. They cannot move these two pawns. Uh, they cannot move the knight anywhere. Uh, they could go knight f2, but in, in that case, I believe uh, bishop, bishop d2 would work. And then try some checks on the uh, first rank, for example. And uh, the queen cannot really go anywhere. The king cannot really go anywhere. So maybe g4, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but maybe this move to try to keep the pawns on lie square. Um, maybe this could have tried to hold the game a little bit longer, but because of all this, uh, because the queens are still on the board, black can still try to play uh, for win, maybe bishop f4, then uh, some h5, trying to open a second front, create another weakness for white, and uh, possibly be able to uh, convert it into a win, but it's going to be still a little bit tough. However, in this position, I'm... Dominguez blundered the last time. He played c3. And why is this a blunder? Try to pause the video and find the last couple of moves of the game. Okay. c3 was a blunder because after queen d2, white is forced to make a queen trade. And after bishop takes d2, by playing c3, white has left this b3 pawn all by itself. So now, uh, if you capture, this a pawn is unstoppable. And the king is not in the box of the pawn. And if you play king e2, which was played by Dominguez in the game, simply bishop c1, black is not allowing any counterplay. And after b takes c4, a4, and once again, this pawn is unstoppable. I really hope you enjoyed this game and I'm sorry for posting the video so late. It should not happen again, but um, sometimes life happens. So I will try my best to make this post on time so that everybody can enjoy one time a day a beautiful game. I really hope you learned a lot from uh, this game, specifically focusing on the important rules that you are learning as you're playing chess. Uh, so make sure you double check everything. Do not um, make your decisions based on some ideas that you heard or some laws or anything like that. Make sure you're checking everything and that the position in which you're making a specific decision is, uh, is going to be the right position to make that decision. That's all for now. I better go to sleep. I'm going to see you soon um, in the next video. Thanks. Bye.